He is perhaps India's most popular soldier general. He was the co commander in charge of Kashmir, including the Kashmir Valley, when the Pulwama terror attack happened. And his memoir is now one of the most anticipated books that's about to be published. It's called Kitne Gazi Aaye, Kitne Gazi Gaye. And Lieutenant General KJS Dhillon, better known as Tiny Dhillon, to all his millions of admirers in India around the world, is here with us for that first detailed interview ahead of the publication of his book, as well as to talk about some of the big things facing us as a nation today. General Dillon, always a pleasure. Good to see you here on India Today. Thank you for your time, sir. First of all, congratulations on your upcoming book. We're all looking forward to it very greatly. But I want to start with something that is not only your passion, but something that the entire country is seeing right now, sir, which is the Turkey earthquake. And once again, it is the Indian army that is helping over there. Uh, in the common Indian's mind, there is a perception that no matter what the problem, the Indian army is called in to help. What is it about the Indian army, sir, you know, having, having led large numbers of men and women uh, over your career, what is it about the Indian army that they have such an amazing reputation, not just here in India, but also abroad in the worst situations? Uh, thank you, Shiv. And uh, first of all, uh, good day to all our viewers. Indian Army, the ethos, the culture, the upbringing, the mentoring, the training, the chiseling, I can continue yeah. saying these words, is something which is beyond explainable words. It's a phenomenon. I served Indian Army, if I include my NDA and IMA training, mm. 43 years. Never in these 43 years I ever had this feeling that job can take a second seat. Yeah. I had written in the book which you mentioned, I was not home when both my children were born. I was not there when they were, went to school, when they did their schooling, completed their schooling, when they went to professional colleges. So Indian Army is judged by Yalag. And they are a very people friendly army. Even in situations in Northeast and in Kashmir, you covered yeah. them so extensively. The people there, in spite of all the propaganda, they say, Sab army ki post mm. nazdik mm. They feel very secure, they feel very safe when there is an army yeah. close by. And then again, we are an army of India. India is a very diverse nation. We are a very diverse army. We do our job properly and you talked about Turkey. Mm. In spite of whatever the diplomacy or whatever the states uh, have been doing in the past, when there is a job to do, the humanitarian aid, Turkish citizens have to be saved, Indian army contingent, the medic... And the army was off yes. instantly. I, 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 there was no time wasted at all. Yes, I tweeted about it. Yeah. I said, Indian government decides, yeah. LGPI is moving. Yeah. So this is how it works. And a nation of our size, the army of our size, the military might. Mm. We have to be prepared for all contingencies at all times. Yeah. Only country in the world with two nuclear neighbors and both not very friendly to you. Yeah. So we have to keep our powder dry all the while and out of area contingencies, humanitarian aid contingencies, any counter-terrorist contingency or mm. you know, sub-conventional convention. Yeah. We need to be every time ready for everything. Yeah. How much energy does it take, General, to keep the powder dry at all times? You know, Bahar se it looks very easy. Huh? You have to be ready at all times. But it must, there must be a cost and an energy expenditure to constantly be combat ready, constantly be prepared to fly at a moment's notice, no matter where the problem is in the world. See, Indian Defence Forces, Army, Navy, Air Force, all together, as also the paramilitary forces, maybe ITBP, BSF, CRPF, who are supporting the defense forces yeah. during peace as well as during war. They have to be ready all the time for all the contingencies like I said earlier and keeping the powder dry is easier said than done. Yeah. Yeah. They are very specialist weapon systems, they are very specialist ammunition. Yeah, right. Those ammunition have shelf lives. Those ammunition have storage requirements of maintenance of particular temperatures. Those ammunition have problems of carriage. You cannot carry them in a particular type of a transport system. Those ammunition will have to be replenished. They have right. to be turned over. Their life has to be checked every now and mm -hmm. then. Mm -hmm. So it's a very complicated and complex system which various wings of the army, 
same is true for Navy and Air Force, who are continuously on the job, yeah. keeping your men in shape, keeping your fleet in shape, keeping your heavy equipment in shape, keeping your ammunition ready and replenished, and obsolete ammunition disposal. It right. happens in a very, very complex, but in a very synthesized manner. Yeah, yeah. And it's, it's, a, it's a major oppression. I'm sure you are aware of it. Absolutely. But uh, countrymen, I think it's enough to say the lot which goes into it. Yeah. And, and, you know, the work speaks for itself. Nobody needs to, uh, you know, uh, shout about it. The fact is the army quietly does its work. And that's the most amazing thing about it. General, now coming to a topic that's, that's very close to you, but has have been one of the most troubling episodes in our country, which is the Pulwama terror attack. Your book comes out on the fourth anniversary of the Pulwama terror attack. Reading your book, one comes to know that you had just taken over the, uh, the, the Chinar Corps in Srinagar when the terror attack had happened. So, in, 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 in more ways than one, the Pulwama terror attack was your trial by fire. You were thrust straight into a nightmare as soon as you had taken charge. You had experience in Kashmir, but this was the probably the maximum level trial by fire that could happen. Take us through what happened that day, sir. Like, you were there, just four days old in that position. What happened? Like you said, I took over the responsibility of the command of Chinar Corps on 10th of February yeah. 2019. I had multiple tenures yes. earlier. I have been there since Captain Days of 1988. I have seen yeah. 19th of January, so with 1990 yeah. and everything. I have seen Kashmiri Pandit Exodus. I have seen a number of operations before that. And 10th of February, I take over. 14th February, an attack of the magnitude of where we lost 40 Bravehearts of mm -hmm. CRPF. This type of attack had not happened in Kashmir terrorism history earlier with so much of damage. Yes, it took time for us to understand the magnitude of the damage. Yes. But there was no time to be lost. We got down to work straight away. Immediately. Mm -hmm. We immediately, like I'll give you a small anecdote I read in the book also, when I was traveling for a meeting, my ADC, Captain Sandeep Singh, mm -hmm. naturally a young officer, yeah. he was also following up the uh, thing, this is 14th February evening, and he asked me in the vehicle, he said, sir, ab kya hoga? Again, pardon my language, I said, we will <laughs> Now that is the time we need to recompose ourselves, get our composer together, get our yeah. act together, and then we got down to it. Yeah. Within 48 hours, we got the intelligence, yeah. we struck, and less than 100 hours, we eliminated that module. Yeah. The commander of that module was the code word Ghazi Kamran. Yeah. Yeah. And this is how Kitne Ghazi I of your book. And everyone remembers that, uh, you know, that press conference as well. Uh, it is, it is, uh, it must have been a source of amazing pride to take over the Kashmir core. Uh, after having served in the in, in Kashmir, such a beautiful place, uh, you know, and, and I, I'm sure you would join me in, in you know recommending to all all those watching that they must go and spend some time in Kashmir. It's a part of our great country, lovely, lovely place. But being there as a soldier is a different experience altogether, sir. Because there you are not there. It's not a holiday. It's not a picnic. Uh, you know, any day could be your last. So I want to know, since having having served on you know on the frontiers and the line of control, high altitude areas, etc. Uh, you know, death is always possibly around just the corner. You've touched upon some of the instances in your book. Uh, I want to know from you, what is your most, most telling memory of a close brush? A close brush where you thought, this is it. This is the end now. This happened... Uh, the reason the I'm asking is because most young people want to know that from those okay. who've served. See, uh, this happened, although I had more tenures in Kashmir, yeah. I had number of encounters in Kashmir where I was personally involved. But this particular incident which you are referring to, yeah. the closest brush happened in Manipur. Right. I was posted as a major in Rashtra Rifles in Manipur. And uh, this was July of uh, 2000, uh, uh, July of, uh, yeah, July of 98, mm. July of 98. And we got information at 11 in the night that in a particular village there are 40 insurgents with the machine guns and all. Right. My commanding officer gave this information and he also told me, Tani, lagta nahi hai sahi hai. this is too huge a number. Mm -hmm. I said, no sir, this particular village is a known place. It has acted as a training camp for the terrorist uh, insurgents earlier. So this information is correct. It was on a pinnacle of yeah. a hillock. So I said, I will hit with a small team of 10 people. I will hit the village. The insurgents will run down. So we will have strong ambushes at the base. Right. 
and I put 20 men each at 4-5 places and I with a small team hit that village. It was raining the whole night. We walked for 4 hours and early morning as you are aware, uh, in northeast the sun rises early. Yes. It was in 4.35 and sun was just coming out and as I was approaching the village from the top the sensor agent opened up with a machine gun and a grenade launcher. So while and you were climbing up? While I was climbing up and uh, I looked into his eyes, he looked into my eyes, it was just for 30-40 meters and these bullets were not hitting me. Mm -hmm. There is something called plunging fire. Right. When you fire downhill, the gravity takes the bullets away from the a point of hit. Right. Right. I explained this and this. Yes. And imagine you are looking into his eyes, he is looking into your eyes and he is firing at you and you are not getting hit. Right. <laughs> and that is when I called for the two inch motor because I knew I also won't be able to hit him mm. in spite of having say, Because sing. he has the advantage of He has the advantage. So we got the two inch motor, Naik Krishipal, he w ran up to me and uh, we then fired and then that operation continued for three days. And again I had close brushes in that operation. But beautiful thing is next day morning, we were out of communication the whole day. Yeah. Next day we were chasing this terrorist and next day in the, I got into a place where I could communicate. So first thing my headquarters was asking, is everything okay, is everything okay? So I said, after giving the report, I told them, I said, there's a boy whose wife is in hospital. Please check and let me know what is the condition. Mm. So this is how we, and then second yeah. thing was, I said, my wife's birthday is coming after a few days. I may or may not return, please wish her. <laughs> so this is yeah. keeping your senses alive, yeah. Yeah. keeping your human angle, yeah. humanitarian aspects of soldier. This is, uh, the human, humanitarian aspect of the soldier is another thing that is, you know, very, very commonly portrayed in the public sphere, you know, the buddy system, soldiers together, camaraderie in the, in the forces. But most people, you know, they, they, they see it, they applaud it, general, but I don't think people understand it as a soldier and a general can. Explain that to us, you know, the, the, the capacity of people like you to put your life in your soldier's hands, your soldier to put his life in your hands. How does that work? And, in, you know, explain that with a situation where, you know, two men or a group of men have actually realized that my life is in another person's hands. Uh, Shiv, it is like this. Soldier, by appearance, looks a very tough man, yeah. very burly face, twirling moustaches yeah. and big smart gun. But inside, he is a very, very nice, simple human being. Mm. He has a family, he has his fears, he has his parents, People he has like his children, yeah. everyone. Yeah. We come or from, the, like me, yeah, yeah. We come from yeah. the same society. Yeah. But there comes a time when we leave apart all these things and then we only look at our job, yeah. job at hand. And coming to buddy system, and buddy system is there are 10 boys in a bunker, mm. one man or a buddy pair is standing guard outside, one on the say northern side, one on the western side. It's breezy, it's snowing, it's chillingly cold. Now this man is giving the duty, yeah. something called imandari, wafadari, zimedari. Right. Imandari and Wafadari, we all understand. Yes. Zimedari is something with which this man is standing guard. Mm. Ten people are sleeping inside. Yeah, yeah. And he is Zimedar for the safety of these ten men. Yeah. No compromise. He no compromise. And why no compromise? Now he is standing there if enemy fires or terrorist fire. Mm, mm. He will save these ten men. Yeah. But after two hours, he will go inside and sleep. Yeah. Somebody else will come out and stand guard. Mm, mm. And then it is Zimedari. Right. So Zimedari is in our DNA. Yeah. We can never let down yeah. our buddy because it is not that we are letting down. It is next moment he may be letting you down. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it is an unwritten law. Right. Nobody leaves the buddy. We don't even leave our dead behind. Yes. So those are ethos of Indian Army. The, the, uh, this is something that's captured quite often in movies as well, sir. Uh, uh, in India, we've seen movies about the armed forces quite a bit from many, many years, and I'm sure you've seen many of them as well. How does a soldier like you feel when you see the movies? Because the movies capture the glamorous aspect of it, the patriotic aspect of it. But like you said, it's not a cakewalk. It's not all hunky-dory in the armed forces. Yes, there's a great deal of nobility and pride and, uh, you know, and patriotism, but an overwhelming part of it is difficult. It is a, it, there's a great deal of drudgery, there's a great deal of uh, mental stress, anxiety. How do, how do you feel when you watch the movies? Do you feel like they should portray more about the reality of the armed forces, sir? Uh, movies not, in India. I'm not saying that they're wrong, but you know, a more realistic portrayal. Movies in India, you know, especially the war movies, mm. the military movies, if I may call it, Earlier, if you remember in our childhood, there used to be this Colonel Saab with handlebar yeah, moustache yeah, yeah. carrying a 12-bore gun yeah. and you know, Mardunga, yeah. 
that is not the way a soldier is. Mm. Soldiering is a very, very serious business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the movie making has to be very done very seriously. Yeah. We can't have, uh, you know, a soldier running around the trees and singing songs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he has his lighter moments. Yeah. He has his enjoyable moments. Those can be captured. But when you can't have a 23-year-old person wearing left and general's ranks. Mm, mm, mm. Doesn't happen. Yeah, embarrassing errors are all embarrassing. there. And then the uniform is wrong. You are wearing a beret of a different... Yeah. Uh, wing of the army, yeah. you are wearing the shoulder titles and so research work which yeah. has to go, serious research work. Fortunately, lot has improved, improved in yes, improved in last few years. Yeah. Having said that, still a lot needs to go into the research work mm -hmm. and the serious research work. Yeah. Yeah. I understand there are commercial uh, constraints. Yeah. But then if you are making a war movie, you are yeah. making a war movie. Correct. You can't be singing songs during the yeah. war. No, the subject matter is too serious. Too, too serious. Too, 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 too for any kind of, uh, you know, compromise. I understand that. You know, uh, General Dillon, as many, many uh, admirers of General Dillon will know, he has embraced social media in a, in a very, very open manner. He talks to his, uh, his audience. He's constantly answering their questions. Uh, he's, uh, you know, always uh, says thank you to compliments from no matter where they come from. And I'm, I'm guessing you get them all day, sir. But, you know, social media is also a very serious business. And you've seen the the flip side of social media as the Kashmir commander, I'm sure. So I wanted to know about your experience with that because we've seen how terror groups have used social media for recruitment, for propaganda, for their own, you know, sinister purposes, especially in the Kashmir Valley, sir. How did you handle all of that? Because your understanding of social media is amazing. So how did you handle the flip side of social media by terror groups? Pakistan has a narrative, has a propaganda. Yeah. And he uses social media to spread that propaganda mm. and spread that narrative. If we do not portray our part yeah. or our point of view, and most importantly, in a transparent manner, in an ethical manner, mm. in a truthful mm. manner, there is no bigger propaganda than yeah. being truthful. There is no bigger propaganda than being transparent. So finally, the lies will come out. Mm. There was a Prime Minister of Pakistan who tweeted the wrong photographs. Correct, correct, correct. So he got caught. But if you are truthful, and my point when managing social media is managing of perceptions of young minds. Mm. If I am not honest in my say, social media content, yeah. if I am not transparent, if I don't respond to questions. But the only thing I always tell, I mean, yesterday also I tweeted, I said we can discuss, let's not argue. Mm. Mm. Let's not be abusive. Mm. We can convey your point of view very firmly without yeah. being abusive. I have seen on social media friends of years are blocking each other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So social media by definition, media is a platform yeah. or a sort of a medium given to you to interact socially. Yeah, yeah. So it's a social interaction platform. But did it ever did it ever pose a challenge for you, sir? Did you ever think that, you know, how does one tackle this challenge where you have uh, you know inimical elements, anti national elements, terror groups using these same platforms that are otherwise beneficial to society? to go against the country, go against the army. Was How big a challenge was that? Yeah, it's a challenge because Pakistan social media management or the yeah. perception management or the narrative building, yes. they do it in a very, very systematic yes, manner. Yes, absolutely. To, co to counter it, you have to pick up their content, mm. you have to say this is wrong and you have to counter them with facts. Making a mere statement that this video by Pakistan is a propaganda, yeah will not help. It will probably also have doubt on your credibility. Mm, mm. But if I give the corroboration, if I give the origin of that video, and mm. if I give why this video is not what it is being yeah. portrayed, yeah. then my credibility goes up. Yeah. So it is not important to, you know, sort of give a rebuttal immediately. You must counter it with facts, figures. Yes. Like some small thing like when did the terrorism begin in Kashmir? In my book I written, I said 19th January 1990 was a date. Yes. yes. A very serious date, very black day. Mm. But the terrorism started much earlier. Yeah. People are not ready to talk about it mm. because it doesn't suit their constituency. Right. And there are so many narratives. There are so many narratives. Yeah, yeah. Narratives within narratives. Yeah. Oh, and speaking of narratives, sir, um, I know for a fact that soldier generals like General Dillon like to keep away from politics. So I'm not going to touch upon politics at all. But to frame my question, I'd like to say that there has been a lot of politics over how safe is Kashmir right now. Recently, we saw the Bharat Jodo Yatra over there. Then we saw a huge Tutu Meme happen in parliament, where, where one side said, we went there, it's not safe. The other side said, you walk there, it's totally safe. You proved our point. 
my my personal sense is that the common average indian would would more readily believe a soldier who has served there than anyone else perhaps uh, so i want i i want your view sir of what kashmir is like right now especially after the abrogation of article 370 and especially at now because i'm sure you visited recently as well how much has it changed how safe is it what is what is the status shiv again i will base my argument or my logic on facts and figures yeah there are indices which which will give you how what is the level of terrorism mm. firstly how many terrorist initiated incidents are happening how many local boys are joining the terrorist team yes. how many actions of terrorist and the civilians are getting killed how many security forces personnel are getting killed how much infiltration is happening so all these indices combined together mm. our pointers about the situation then tourism how many tourists are coming in hotel bookings all these are the indices yes and i dare say all these indices are down yeah compared to any time year on year or a quarter on quarter tourism or tourism is up but everything else is down else is down yeah i'm saying in the you can wait at the way you want it yeah, yeah. so every index is in the favor of peace mm, mm. so i will not make a yeah you know statement without facts right they very fable facts so you are saying we don't need to be subjected the data yeah data that data proves better. data speaks hmm. the data speaks for itself yeah yeah so kashmir is a much safer and peaceful place yes as compared to any time prior to today you can have a yeah. year on year or like i said quarter on quarter whatever yeah, yeah. and it is improving further yeah absolutely. and why it is improving is very important yeah. the common kashmiri the awam they have tested the dividends of peace yeah. when the tourism goes up when the peace goes up when the shop is open till 8 o'clock he is earning more he is get more job creation schools are open children are getting educated right. there is a better prospect for the future children the future of children yeah. so when he tested all these dividends of peace now he doesn't want to go back to right. the black days yes so it is the yearning of the local kashmiri which is forcing even pakistan to stop this nonsense yeah absolutely and that is why kashmir's peace journey is now irrevocable it's irrevocable yes absolutely but things are still sensitive and uh, you know i hope that things don't move into a reverse gear uh, uh, believe me when i say that kashmir is one of the most beautiful places not just in india but the world and i encourage our, our viewers to plan your holidays there don't constantly think about going abroad go and spend a winter in kashmir you will be thanking me trust me my final question to you to come back once again to kashmir uh, general and once again to some you know something that you've spoken about in your book is pulwama and sadly most often the indian public hears about kashmir when soldiers or officers are killed in action in an encounter like pulwama or any other terror attack or encounter that's when it happens you as a as a as a you know a, a core commander have had to make those difficult phone calls even previously to families of men under your charge who may have lost their lives in operations i want to know th about that sir how difficult is that because you have to break the news to a uh, either a wife next of kin parents who mi might not be very old about losing their loved one tell us about that process how difficult is that most difficult job in a commander's uh, service career is to salute your comrades for the one last time yeah. and lay the wreath this particular press conference and this photograph on the cover of the book happened after i had laid the wreath on the mortal remains of major vibhuti dondial and the soldiers who got killed in action during the pinglana operation yes. where we eliminated gazi straight from the war memorial i came to the press conference and lot of people say there lot of anger in your eyes it is not without reason so coming back to your question most difficult job in a commander's life is to pay the homage or lay the wreath and again the most difficult thing is to call up someone and say i'm sorry to inform you yeah. this is what happened to your son or the and here i would like to say our wives army wives army parents they are the strongest people on this planet yeah, true my wife has heard my death news or seen my death news on the tv twice yeah i mentioned once mm. when she was eight months pregnant yes i remember that but she held herself together for the same wafadari imandari zimedari wafadari she did not want to show herself as a shattered person 
So our families are also very strong and somewhere at the back of their mind, every time the phone rings, the heartbeat goes up. Absolutely. Absolutely. And they are expecting probably the worst news, yes. especially once you are posted in such areas. But they hold the fort together so the soldier can do his duty yes. without having to look back or be bothered about his home front. So I think we have a wonderful companionship here and every soldier I can talk about. On that, on that uh, you know, very sobering note and a reminder to all of us as citizens is, uh, you know, perhaps to, uh, uh, you know, make a country that's worth protecting. It's not a proverb or a cliche because, uh, so, you know, we cannot unfortunately meet all of our soldiers and thank them personally, but we can be good Indian citizens and make a country that's worth protecting. And as the general said, military families are truly made of something else. So our salute not just to soldiers and generals, but also to those families. And what better tribute could there be to those who were lost in Pulwama and other terror attacks than a book that pays tribute as well as remembers and talks about everything and has a forward-looking perspective on how the country has changed, is changing and will be changing in the days ahead. General Dillon, thank you very much. Thank a you. pleasure and an honor. Thank you for speaking to India. Thank, thank, thank you. Very much.